good morning everybody uh, and thank you for inviting me and uh, I have the opportunity of meeting some old uh, like mentors. He doesn't know me but Kirti Bhai, I just, I had heard of him in 88 and but never worked with him and uh, also community architects I took with all the youngsters here. Uh, these are the lines which inspire us. Uh, from the great writer Sri Aurobindo and I am going to take you uh, through a small uh, journey which I have had in last about 25 years uh, which might touch some of the issues which you have discussed here it may not touch, it might answer some of the questions which you have uh, and we can discuss little further afterwards I originally I come from western part of India which is like a, the state of Gujarat, which is a coastal, which has a very nice coastal area, little inland area. And I really think that a lot of work which we do normally in our, uh, uh, our life does have some connections where we come from. So this, it's a beautiful village of Drafa, which uh, my family comes from. And as you can see, it has its own uh, life, its own welcoming doorways, its own artisans, its own uh, very intricate uh, uh, woodworking, its own custom made solutions, uh, you can say. Uh, and as we are talking about community architects and working together and co creation, I really think that sometimes some of our traditional buildings, wherever we are, do teach us what co creation is all about because we don't know who are the architects who built this. As you know, India is very colourful, it has its own colours, it has its own recycling uh, methods which this is how we used to recycle, this is, our, this is our interior design and some of these images, most of them are from one small village and India has 600,000 of them. So you can imagine what scale we are talking about. Its own symbolism, it has its own relaxed atmosphere on the streets, it has own its intensity, the people are very intense, at the same time they have an attitude, very attitude, like the communities we work with, its own wisdom again, the wisdom which is also inbuilt in our building systems and all. And you see in every little detail of a small village what design is, how contemporary and the traditional coexists even in an in a Indian village. Everywhere. It has its own product designers who design all these fabulous small small things which we see around. Many unknown craftsmen who build every intricate detail in a village. How do we understand, how do we learn in contemporary architecture, I think that is more important. This is a landscape of Savarashtra. Again, it has its own sea, little mountains, very beautiful seashore, quite nice hilly areas in some uh, seashore area, very similar to many of the Asian countries which we are all used to. And uh, many communities like from the shore communities like fishermen communities or you have many different different communities which have actually enriched this whole uh, space, the whole culture, you know, how the whole culture was has evolved. And as we see in many of these traditions, the timelessness I think which we are looking for in contemporary architecture, everything what we do looks very dated. Whether it's new today, tomorrow, it's just out of fashion. So I think something which we can really learn from the communities who have built this great thing, that there are very timeless uh, things. The same colors and the same craft, again, when you get go to architecture of Savarashtra region, it does start reflecting in architecture as normal house verandas. These are normal streets, these are not those beautiful exotic villages you see in the pictures, but these are the realities of life. There, there are housing issues, there are same time the same craftsmen have also built for rich people. It's not that people were not building for rich people. These are the public buildings and private buildings of that area. And it has some beautiful building technologies using all the local materials. The scale was, as you go out of the village, the scale was becoming little bigger. So the complexes were uh, coming, the like palace complexes or uh, community complexes or residential complexes and all. And the same material with the same artisans who built those simple things in village got a completely urban scale. So even the urban scale was very different. 
So it was not like that uh, we are doing very very small work, so we cannot do big work. It's the same craftsmen, the same hands have built all this. Uh, these are some of the images of the cities, like you know, which are like cities from about 3,000 people to 300,000 people, that kind of cities. And these are like very small, medium towns in India, when you talk about it. Uh, how do we evolve and how we inspire ourselves, that is up to us. I think a lot of things which we discussed in the morning session, which were coming as question to many young architects. I was also one of them 20 years ago, I am still like that. I, st I still haven't figured out whether community architecture is something which I am doing or I am doing building for the rich people. Because our range is from very small to very big. And that is why even in architecture when I see this, when I am sure sharing these images with you, these are all the images which I grew up seeing. This is the rail private railway station that I was managing, uh, mentioning in the morning. The Maharajas were building a private railway station. This is a palace on the seashore in Porbandar, where the whole city is like a beautifully planned town and it has a lot of potential for a lot of these things which you talk about. This is a Mahatma Gandhi's house, the, the great father of nation in India and he, he, he is born in Porbandar. So his house where he was born also has a great elements of the local architecture. Again, over a little higher middle class like that. The same materials was also used in creating public spaces like this. The same material. So this is the stone which the, the town, those areas in Savarashtra, this stone mines are quite known in the coastal belt of uh, India. And these are the, some of the different materials which, uh, which we normally use like bricks and all, all is available. There are skills like this which I am sure in many Asian countries you have where people built boats even without a drawing. So I don't think a great technical drawing can create something. And all these techniques are still not explored in contemporary architecture. I mean, designing a good roof by using the same thing, it's not been explored. How do we take these traditions further? Uh, that was my search. And that's where in, I was just mentioning Kirti Bhai that like in 88 when I met some of his Assad people in, uh, in Kerala when I was exploring the architecture of Lori Baker in Kerala. And I wanted to go and work there. And then after the 89, I had an accident and I could not go there. And in 91, I moved to Auroville. So when I moved to Auroville, again, Auroville is one of these beautiful exotic places where a lot of uh, young architects like you, like we have thousands of them who keep on visiting us every year. The charter of Auroville, when I read first time, it really inspired me. It used something like humanity as a whole, then something like unending education and uh, there is a discovery from within and from without. So these are the phrases which when I read and I thought oh, maybe something is there for me, maybe I want to explore that in my life, a site of material and spiritual researches. So that's when I uh, moved to Auroville and uh, I would not go into the early history but I think from 93, 92 onwards we have been working alone. So my office, which is uh, now called The Studio, uh, it's basically, we like to learn and we like, like to work in different ways and we try to connect and work with different similar organizations uh, within the country and outside and that is why I'm here. We work closely with some of these organizations who are connected with uh, the Community Actress Network and who asked me to come here, so I just, without thinking, I just came. Uh, we really like to create that space for artisans in contemporary Indian architecture because even Indian architecture having had such a huge history of uh, great craftsmanship uh, completely has missed out on the, on the touch of hand in, in today's contemporary buildings. And that was one thing which inspired me and when I came to Auroville, even in Auroville I saw some of the nice buildings but there also I felt the lack of doing that. So that's how our practice has slowly developed into something which is very simple, we don't do big projects, we work very consciously on smaller projects and recently we've been starting to work with similar materials but in different different areas. So if you look at our work, I think the whole palette of materials which is earth, terracotta, it is something which we really like that it has its own cultural and cultural identity and the context of where we are working from. We work in <coughs> South India. Uh, South India has its own materials, South India has its own bricks, South India has its own lime, uh, uh, 
uh, whatever flooring, these, that, everything. And it has a very rich building tradition, which is quite different from where I came from originally, which I showed. So if you look at the Madras Terrace, or which was the last slide, and this is the lime plaster, which the craftsman did. A lot of this is also again within, it's really, really like kind of uh, losing out. There are very, very few craftsmen who do that. We use a lot of this color oxide flooring uh, materials, which we constantly keep on experimenting with, uh, where we try to reduce as much as we can from the uh, industrial use. Uh, we try and use a lot of bricks and roofing uh, molds uh, using some lime clusters. So I'm just taking through a palette of the kind of material which we use in our work, and uh, we use a lot of oxide flooring. Uh, we use Gunnar tubes, which Asad has used, I think, in, in 88 in rural housing. And that's when I had first seen it and all. We use the traditional type, terracotta tile, which is a tiled roof of South India. They have two, three layers and all. They have its own brick size. Before the Britishers came, we had our own brick size in India. It was, which we call achikal. It's like a half brick, what we call there. So we try to use that in exposed work. We try to use it in the roofing. This is uh, like a traditional roofing, which uh, in one of the restored houses we did in uh, uh, near Hampi in Anagundi. Uh, of course, the brick walls and uh, uh, normal brick size also we use, uh, metric size bricks and all. Uh, we, I have uh, uh, done some uh, pottery with, uh, there's an American architect, uh, our teacher Ray Maker, who, who lives and works in Pondicherry. So my interest was in also using terracotta in architecture and how to use it. So we use a lot of hollow blocks. Sometimes we make it aside, we also use some of the industrially made blocks in different different ways. So these are some of the roofing, like jack arch roofing, we try to use it in facade of some buildings. Uh, uh, there is a lot of good pottery tradition in South India, where we use these terracotta plates as filler slabs and everything, which I was inspired by. Of course, South India has done a lot of, in Glory Maker, has done a lot of filler slabs. So most of these things which we do is within the contemporary architecture context. Uh, and uh, of course the guna tubes, the, we try to use all the local potters who, who make these tubes and uh, without steel and cement you can have nice large spans, 3 meters, 4 meters, even larger. And a lot of work has been done in India, but in contemporary architecture you don't see these uh, things much. We use of course ferro cement, uh, that kind of uh, thing, precasting. Uh, there are different things of, like we have very rich granite tradition in South India. So we use granite, we use a lot of rammed earth and uh, like simple earth clusters, uh, trying to use terracotta and rammed earth together, we try and create spaces. Uh, we do a lot of recasting elements uh, and everything and then kind of, because the rammed earth has a very good texture which goes very well with the life we have there. And uh, so these are like kind of the images you see again and again coming into our work and we try and make small space is more interesting than all. So practically what I think what Madam said before, like no, when you trans trying to transform outside, you transform inside. And we try and we really, really love this material. So our search of how local aesthetics and local contextual innovations and architecture, how can we make it rich by doing whatever we are doing. Whether it's a rich person's house, poor person's house, as a designer it doesn't matter to us. A good designer will anyway work in its context. So we try and use a lot of uh, artistic things within our work. We, like these are the rammed earth walls and textures which um, which kind of we see uh, regularly in our work and we keep on doing. Uh, mostly we do stabilized earth because it needs little less maintenance than the uh, unstabilized earth. Uh, we use some kind of a mystic symbolism here and there. Uh, we have a lot of South India, we, we get a lot of recycled wood. So we try and do recycled windows, doors. We hardly buy new wood. We have a lot of ceramic tradition because of Ray and Deborah there. We have a lot of good ceramic tradition. We try to use ceramics or broken tubes. We try to make into jallies or kind of spaces which... Uh, and we have like sometimes precast, these are tiled roof, precast rafters, everything. So in simplicity, if you really want to ex like kind of explain our, we call it a fine blending of opposites. This is a, a phrase by Sri Aurobindo in when he wrote an essay on Indian architecture in 1904. Uh, replying to uh, a, a British uh, uh, art critic called Dr. Archer and that essay is something which I really really think that uh, we should have in our curriculum which I am trying but hasn't happened yet. I'll take you through a quick 
look of a few images of our projects, uh, which we keep on doing. But uh, our scale of work is very, uh, I would say, uh, small in scale. Like we, we do small, livable thousand, two thousand square foot per houses to little larger houses. Uh, our clientele is uh, usually in Auroville. It's Aurovillians and the residents who are there. This was a student guest house I did in 1994 uh, where we did a lot of recycled tiles and everything we recycled and gave it a new form and uh, uh, there are a few residences we built in and around Auroville and in different parts of India and we try to see what context we are building in and how we are building it. So obviously the element which I showed you like the earth or the terracotta or the lime or recycling uh, these things like oh, we live in South India where you almost don't have a winter so we can even use we can almost practically avoid the use of glass. We can just simply have a nice mesh. It's very good, comfortable. We have a lot of uh, cross ventilation, the courtyards. Uh, all these things are like, no, are, are very simple and basic elements of how you make your life simple, but again, very enriching. You don't need to design air conditioned spaces in South India. Uh, bathrooms are generally quite like semi open, open kind of bathrooms. <coughs> Which also, it, it has also its own luxury. It doesn't have to have a very fancy thing, but it can be very, very simple. So most of our work is uh, in the context of Auroville and in South India. Uh, when we are slowly now uh, moving to a different scale that uh, we'll come across, we have done some uh, heritage conservation work because when you really move around in India and you see what is happening to our heritage, so we are constantly asked for that. So recently we have been doing that. I mean, uh, this was an old uh, house which was a bank which we restored into a hotel. Then there's Anagundi in Hampi, which is a great uh, Vijayanik empire. Uh, there's royal family's house which we have just restored. This is just almost finished now. So the final pictures are not there. But this is a completely broken down which uh, like kind of a... It's, the plinth is about 400, 500, 500 year old. But the whole house has been uh, uh, rebuilt now. And uh, so, if you really, uh, I mean, again, uh, if you look at the uh, the materials and uh, the texture which we use, we do a lot of this wall, the floor oxide, we try to avoid like industrial uh, ceramics as much as we can and uh, so we have like good craftsmen, fortunately we in South India we do have this, some of these skills very alive even today. Again it's very fast changing, it, it's almost like in last 10 years also I have seen a huge change in the way uh, things are done even within oral. So it's not about or will be a very conscious community. So I don't think that change does not leave us also. Even if you may be very aware of issues, but still you may be tempted to change very, very fast. No? Uh, we have a design studio of about, uh, we are about 25 people, uh, about 13 architects and usually we have between 10 to 12 uh, interns, people who come and work with us for uh, one year or Two, one or two years or something and uh, so we, we moved uh, I mean our studio is like now I've been working there for 25 years but it's a this is our studio space and where uh, we tried to use it was a residential community which we were building and within that finally we, we also thought that it would be nice for us to work it's a kind of a mixed residential community we had designed mixed use where people live and work so we also decided we'll come and live and work. Uh, we work there, so we, we are based there. And it has a lot of these elements of like oxide flooring, the simple oxide floorings, the, the, the uh, terracotta tubes, walls. We have a lot of granite and everything we have used in the bathrooms. And uh, uh, we, uh, I have worked with ceramics before and I'm also married to a ceramist. So we, uh, we, do, uh, we use quite a bit of uh, ceramics in our work. And, uh, and that is how uh, we try to reinterpret some of these elements, how ceramic can become part of architecture or because uh, terracotta pottery is very common in India but again still dying but studio pottery is even less, there are very very few and I am very strongly inspired by Ray Meeker who 
uh, who has kind of pioneered a lot of studio portraits in South India. So, uh, we try to really find those new aesthetics which, which are very contemporary but again rooted very very clearly in our tradition of uh, uh, South India. Uh, if you uh, look at how do we see the direction slowly uh, going, uh, in recent times about like last, uh, uh, I was about 15 years since uh, uh, the Gujarat earthquake, uh, that is when like no, in, when, when earthquake happened in Gujarat at that time, uh, there was a lot of work which started in uh, the Bhunashala and all that, but at that time it was Kachnam and Mahabhyan and a lot of organizations went there. And that is how we got involved with Kachnam Nirma Abhyan and that was our first introduction to some kind of a community architecture. I have been interested in it since about 88 but then I moved to Auroville. Auroville, though it has its own challenges and everything, Auroville does not necessarily uh, focus on community development. It is a community which has an international community uh, which is started as a uh, intentional international community. So the focus is rather more on unity, processes, organization and all that. Uh, city plan of Auroville was done in 1968 which which is like a, uh, if you look at it now, if you look at that as a plan as it was built in 1968, it can be very controversial because the whole world has changed in the last 50 years. So uh, it was not considering community at all, it was more like a vision of an architect or a very utopian vision and so what you see a lot of these things in the in the imagery of Auroville website and all that when you come there there might be some disappointments you have so you can ask me uh, and we can discuss in detail in question answer sessions but uh, uh, having worked in Auroville and having very strong uh, I would call it like uh, the other aesthetics then Auroville was originated from I have had a tough time also working in Auroville and I, I tell it in public forums also at times and especially in the intimate forum I can tell because it is not that lot of things which we do are integral part of Auroville in every way. It is not. Our work is more rooted in the country and the South Indian tradition than only in Auroville tradition. But Auroville is part of it and we have learned a lot from the communities and traditions. So, this is where uh, uh, a few years ago when as I said, but I will not go from 2001 how we got involved in tsunami and earthquake and all. But recently the chance came together where what Kirti Bhai suggested that he asked uh, uh, in the forum where how many of them knew Indira Avas Yojana and uh, so that is very true, people just don't. So when the consortium started of uh, the Hunashala Foundation, these are the four states we have been uh, doing this work since last about four years. It's Gujarat, uh, Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh and West Bengal and we have studied all the the kind of how people build in the tradition. So I'll take you through a quick uh, imagery of like how the houses which non-architects are building or the people are building. These are the community architects for me. I don't, you don't even need, they don't even need a network or a forum because our architecture has completely evolved from a huge tradition of building. Every household uh, we visited in Chhattisgarh state or West Bengal or Gujarat or wherever in the rural communities almost 90% to 100% people know how to build their own houses. They do not even need architects. They even know how to build communities because our idea of community is very different than their idea of community. Ours is more of intentional community. You like me, I like you, we think alike, we make a community. Villages, communities are not formed like that. Village communities are you are different, I am different, you put nose in my uh, affair, I put nose in your affair and still they are a community. So I think a lot of this imagery, I, I constantly, uh, when, when we are looking at architecture, the way we have to look at architecture, how do we recreate that in our contemporary work? How do we recreate this small details and small colourful uh, things and even minimalism, you know? A lot of minimalistic architects I have constant debate with because minimalism also has to be in energy, in social impact, in environment and all that. It cannot just be visual minimalism. So it is and how enriching all the simplicity of the village forms are and I think if we can somehow while keeping all the design exercise we may do in communities, we, we should not forget that the communities have an extremely strong sense of aesthetics 
and i really think that a lot of work which we do need to have that and that we need to explore because unless that inherent sense of beauty which are our uh, former generations have had unless we develop that and the simplest of the material creating the most intricate and most beautiful houses any of this house i was talking to the uh, the morning and i was even telling that in chatisgarh there are communities and government is not able to reach the targets because they said we don't want a house so it's a only outside our idea of what kind of a house we should have so people build only they take 3 years 4 years to build they build extremely slowly because none of their house size fits in the government size at all government says you build a 250 square foot everybody there wants 500 700 800 square foot because they are tribal area they own everything we have seen houses which are built from within 50 meters of radius i came across one house 90 year old being broken down by a person and being rebuilt by the same person which is grandfather built with the same soil in the same place with a slightly different plan and that is where you start questioning what is sustainability you know what we are talking about you know and for us i think those questions are extremely important that we try to create that sense of beauty we try to create that sense of oneness with our culture geography context whatever you will in bastar these are the houses where roof walls these that everything is that from within 15 meters or 100 meters or whatever no and i really think that so this is some of the images of our visits and uh, uh, community discussions because this whole program of the government is first and they ask us to divide the whole state into different zones which are like geographic zones and climatic and everything then within that what people are building so we study that so we studied that and based on that we had to design how people build so practically our role was minimum almost in a sense limited to if people are building and one of the things like one of the i mean fortunately we work with some of the government offices which were also very open because they had asked us that every house like in india we have this concept of kachcha and pakka means one is temporary and the pakka is more permanent so that itself is a big debate in the government circles because some of the secretaries whom we met they were telling that all our temporary houses which people are living in they are surviving for 100 years and the permanent houses we are building are coming in 5 years so how do we redefine this thing and which i think even at policy level kit if i can tell in discussions how it can be done but i think it is one of the biggest challenge we have because a lot of this materials which you see and the kind of simplicity in aesthetic this is a santhal aesthetic and i mean who can say this is not minimal it is pure earth mostly it's cob uh, adobe uh, any form they don't even they don't even use uh, any of the uh, in the cemetery or but slowly obviously everybody wants to change the life when everybody wants to improve the life and all so these are like some of the images like what were bottle and dob and uh, uh, things in the bangal and even simple detail like for example in some of the villages we saw this fantastic detail for sliding windows amazing uh, detail so when you really really go to the communities as uh, like you no know, as a learning person rather than whatever teaching or whatever i think i think your real education starts there and i think what now after doing this three states and looking at these aesthetics of architectural it's after 25 years even like we think that we need to rethink our aesthetics we need to rethink our materials uh, and we really need to rethink like even every square foot extra you build is some kind of a uh, kind of a pressure on the earth you know so i think even reducing that uh, that's very important of course the materials which we saw like were ranging from uh, stone earth and i mean as you know india is a vast vast country we have a huge uh, uh, tradition of uh, building and the materials and everything is so so varied in every different region that it's practically impossible to say okay this is india and this is not it probably you say this for this region is very true and for other region it might be completely not working so i think uh, that learning has to come and our team which we work with i mean though we had in my office we are about as i say 25 people more than 70% of people are all of like between 21 and 33 34 Uh, and they all none of them have had any training in in community uh, whatever workshops and all and i really would like now that i see a lot of people doing here 
this kind of work that that networking i have already invited team for bringing can workshop to orville we would love to host it in in future and how how can we even contribute to even communities like orville because even communities like orville need to kind of reassess how and what we are doing so this is kind of in a nutshell very quickly in my 20 20 25 minutes i and this a uh, great saying of uh, baragan uh, louis baragan who, uh, who who said that the real tradition is contemporary design you have to design for today you cannot just be romantic and say uh, uh, like that okay even old is beautiful it's not like that sometimes our needs have changed everything has changed and there is there is one write up by the mother who started this shirvin rashram in pondicherry like she mentioned this in in 50s when somebody asked her that how do then she said new forms are needed to manifest the new spirit so if your spirit is very different definitely you need new forms of organization you will need new forms of uh, whatever tools equipment everything new you will not be able to do this new thing or the new spirit if you have with the older forms you know you have to redesign so every our materials have to take new form or our aesthetics have to take new form and and knowing now all this and i I whenever I move around this circle it's really really rare I mean I really see that people like you are not enough uh, anywhere you the same people you will meet and uh, that's it with I think if you have 3 minutes more I in fact I had uh, my office people had they were taking over Dhanush bhai because they never know what I am talking so because I never prepare my speech so they had asked <laughs> maybe I can maybe it looks like <laughs> but but uh, they'd asked me that uh, so they had given me a small 3 uh, minutes video to say hi to all of you and uh, i i i criticized it i didn't want to show it to them because it it, it uh, they keep on using the studio so many times so i said it looks like you are advertising but i i it is very informal i was not going to show but because one question came up uh, i think your last moderator asked that like my friends tell me i am a spiritual teacher and all that no and all so uh, before i show that uh, in the small 3 minutes thing i would like to tell you one thing that even i had the same questions uh, 25 years ago i have the same questions now that are you making money and working for the rich or you're making poor uh, working for the poor but what we need is strike a balance no because uh, the proof that i'm sitting here and i'm talking about the studio itself means that Uh, we exist we have existed for 25 years we have survived financially we are not doing too bad we are extremely busy architecture office uh, we we have uh, we are doing indira avas yojana for like so many years we have worked in disasters and we are also building for superstars in india so all this what you see and one thing has shown me that no these aesthetics appeal from smaller smaller clients to the whatever la- larger bigger clients so you can i mean if we have a superstar clientele i'm sure you can have and there are not enough architects and that's why many of us are very busy so if we have good competition we'll be very happy so with that i'll just uh, end and i'll show that one small uh, thing which was in the folder i don't know with this base map can you just uh, can you just clear that yes. i think there's a small video
Everybody says blue studio, that's why I say it's dust. Okay, thank you. So first of all, once again, uh, it's uh, my honor to be here. I hear a lot of uh, wisdom and experience uh, standing over here as a young person as well. Uh, I don't have 25 year experience, I don't have 50 years experience, I have maybe 8 or 10 years. Uh, right now, I'm the director for the International Studio for uh, Turinscape. Uh, we are looking for something which uh, the process for myself, uh, the relearning of learning. Uh, as an architect, I, I, I grew up in a city, I grew up in Hong Kong, I moved to Canada in Toronto, so I basically uh, live in a city. I work in Copenhagen and then now come, uh, come back to Beijing. So with all these different experiences, uh, what should we bring to the table and what will, what we should move forward? Uh, right now, Turinscape is, is fabulous in some way of having an architect working in a landscape-oriented uh, office. What, what kind of thinking that you have to restructure yourself would be part of the uh, design process? Because an architect, which we see a lot of detail, craftsmanship, when it comes to plants, uh, uh, water, how do we deal with some of these issues as an architect? So it becomes like we question ourselves with what is the role of an architect? Are we a curator? Are we uh, a designer? Can we master plan something? Or can we just let it grow spontaneously? So the process of uh, giving in the morning, that we were saying planning is a giving process. So how do we carefully uh, strategically uh, located all this thing uh, into the design. So this is a sentence by the president, current president, uh, President Xi. Uh, he is uh, launching this uh, no weird buildings uh, kind of uh, policy, but uh, looking back into the village, uh, uh, seeing all the mountains, seeing the water, and uh, making home with it within their deep parts. So that kind of uh, related to the uh, whole philosophy of Turinscape. Uh, basically, it uh, means earth and man, so nature and man. So how do we bring nature into the design context as an architect? Uh, it's very important in here. How do we find the relationship and harmonious relationship between land, land and people? So we are a 500, 600 people company. Uh, we, we are super big. Uh, we are founded by uh, the founder, uh, Dr.
Dr. Kung Jing Yu. Uh, he is a fellow member of the ASLA uh, Landscape Architecture Society of America. He is the Dean of uh, Peking University uh, of Landscape and uh, Architecture College and he was uh, a professor uh, of uh, Harvard and then he was the first uh, 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 Doctor of Design uh, uh, as a Chinese uh, graduate from Harvard. So we have four, uh, three and a half office. Uh, our main office is in Beijing at our headquarters, about 450 people. We have a Shanghai branch, about 50 people. We have a Guangzhou branch, also about 30, uh, 30, 40 people. And currently we have half of the office in Hong Kong, which is uh, temporary for uh, meeting and different uh, uses. So. Uh, Turing State was found 18 years. We have finished about, completed about 600 projects, um, uh, built uh, 300 ecological cities and 300 uh, public parks and uh, buildings. Uh, and we have served over 200 uh, different cities. Uh, so this is what happened uh, during the annual dinner uh, for each year. So we have done 3,000 different projects in the past 18 years. So there's a huge boom in, in China. And now we are going outside of China. We have a five, four or five different projects in Singapore. We are working on different uh, uh, projects in Indonesia and outside of uh, China. We have some projects in Seattle as well. So uh, we are a multidisciplinary office because we don't believe in uh, a single design. We have to work with different professions. So we also have in-house engineers, uh, civil engineers, structural engineers, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, specialists. So that will enhance the design. So of course uh, we can skip the awards, uh, but uh, in the uh, <laughs> urbanization uh, kind of process, I think uh, gentrification, urbanization, uh, globalization is something that any Asian city is happening. In China, the urbanization rate is almost two, like almost three percent, growing every single year. So already there's over 50% of population is living in a city. So there's something that we cannot ignore and it will keep happening. Right now, China is talking about 10 mega region. So uh, uh, there's a wrong relation of uh, different things. How can we deal with this? And then in the past, uh, basically all the elites and uh, uh, authority make all the decisions. Uh, so it comes to uh, what this kind of practice in, in, in China back in the days we we, we basically bind the feet of a female uh, that they they are less you know they they, they are meant to be served uh, less productive uh, uh, and and this is called pretty back in the days for for many thousands of years so um, and then not only in China but in different civilization people bang their head people just want to deform their body to make themselves more elite to be more special. So, and this is what we call beautiful. So in the China context, uh, this is what used to be called beautiful. So twisted rocks and, and twisted uh, uh, tree and bonsai, and, and then the lady is uh, having these uh, 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 bag which are bended as well, are called pretty. Uh, so what we are here, uh, you can see this is a, 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 a painting uh, by the, what, what the elite consider as uh, beautiful. But we, we call it the little foot, so you bound the feet. Uh, uh, but it, it looks similar, but it's actually different. Um, uh, and this is a normal rural uh, uh, village in China, uh, which people don't bound their feet. They just maybe just walk on soil. Uh, 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 and, and we call these the big, big foot kind of landscape. So uh, in the past, uh, a landscape uh, or a city development uh, is the best example showing this uh, kind of uh, uh, bound feet uh, uh, gesture. So we channelize the, the river and uh, everywhere in China almost like the same. Uh, we deprive uh, these uh, 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 pro productivity and uh, function of this uh, 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 landscape or, or city uh, and, and different elements. So we change something from which is productive crops into something ornamental that don't provide any uh, 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 goods, which also require a lot of maintenance and care to it. So uh, we change a, a lot of uh, farmland into a lawn. Uh, we change a lot of like a small road into this big road. Uh, 
and then we built big uh, pipes and canal. We built a big dam uh, in order to uh, um, pro uh, prevent a natural disaster like flood. Uh, so uh, we are thinking we built a lot of these great infrastructure, fighting against nature in, in many different ways, and all these machines tend to fail. So um, uh, and we built a lot of roads that we we have this situation of a ghost town. Um, so there's big roads but no car, but in the big city, uh, we have big roads but many cars. So how do we deal with these uh, kind of problems? Uh, and we have uh, this great infrastructure is also very uh, single function, uh, and then we adopt the American kind of uh, 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 attitude, uh, having this uh, jumbo culture, uh, and uh, we start to deform our head to make ourselves to become a bit more different. Uh, and call the landmarks, and then we start twisting our body so that you can see all this kind of thing anywhere, uh, which kind of like the same. Uh, and the worst for Chinese uh, is uh, we adopt this American culture. Everything is to be big, everything is to be jumbo, ginormous. And what does that mean? Uh, and in terms of figure, China is actually consuming uh, 50, over 50% of cement in the world. And over 30% of steel and over 30% of oil uh, in, in the entire world. So uh, we have we spent all these materials to build all these nice or uh, 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 nice building, uh, challenging structure, uh, 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 bird's nest, you know, this uh, opera house, CCTV. There's like this. I, I happen to know the uh, structural engineer. They are looking for the, that tip of cantilever of this 200 meter tall. 300 meter per tower. It takes two days non-stop of welding to just achieve this edge. So what's the point of, of all this? And then all this kind of uh, thing next to a funny kind of skyline in Shanghai that we have this uh, deformed head and twisted body at the same time that puts together. Uh, so we have a little feet of city and we have a big body which is all these buildings are very con high consumption of energy and what does it lead to? It's basically this kind of environmental issue. Uh, we have a lot of flood problem uh, recently. Uh, uh, we spend over um, 100 billion every year uh, to, to, uh, to deal with the flood. Uh, we have drought, 400 city out of the 600 different city, a shortage of uh, water. 70% uh, of the surface water are polluted in China. And then in the last 50 years, the wetland is uh, actually 50% of wetland disappear in, in, in China. So there, there's no habitat for, for, for animals and, and, and birds to uh, live. So and agriculture seems to be something which is normal. It actually contributes to the pollution uh, uh, at the same time. So there is no place for, 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 for people to, to even get close to the water. So this is exactly what happened in China now. It used to be green uh, in the past 30, 40 years. Now it's like a brown field. You can compare Russia and China, and of course with Southeast Asia. So uh, uh, you can just a quick through of how after the kind of uh, open uh, uh, door of uh, China in the last, uh, since 1989, how things are changing rapidly uh, until now. So you can see how things change normally. So it's a moment that we have to really rethink about whether we should still appreciate the so-called little feet, uh, which is unhealthy and, and degree of productivity and low performance, but we call it beautiful back in the days. And, and all we should think about in a big feet kind of way, which is more healthy and rural, but it's actually higher performance. So how do we do it? We need a revolution, for sure. So we need to make some change. So uh, uh, we, the government is actually launching something uh, which is called Punch City right now. Uh, uh, so uh, how do we value a complete kind of e uh, uh, ecosystem of planning? Uh, how do we find a symbiotic kind of relationship between uh, development and nature at the same time? So there are 16 different pilot cities uh, that is happening called the Sponge City in different regions of uh, China. Uh, so to test out how to design a city in a lower impact way. So uh, of course Singapore is uh, actually one of the pioneers in, in some of these kind of uh, uh, innovative thinking. But what we are 
proposing in here is basically two different approach. Um, something we call it the negative approach. Uh, basically, reverse our mindset to put nature right at the beginning, uh, uh, as the highest priority before we plan anything for the city. Uh, and then the second thing is the big food aesthetic uh, that we are proposing in here. So I'm going to flip through a lot of uh, our projects and some of the key uh, consideration of how we design our project. Uh, basically, before we start our plan, plan to draw anything, we start a thorough uh, scientific analysis to try to understand the uh, hydrology system, the topography system, the biodiversity situation, cultural heritage, or where is the landmarks, where is the cultural roots, and, and how do we create these uh, recreational uh, layers in, in this uh, uh, planning. So in terms of extra large kind of uh, a project, is uh, a project that we were commissioned by the government to study about the whole China. China needs to ex expand uh, in a keep expanding in the next uh, 30, 20, 30 years, there's 200 more cities needs to happen, will exist in the near future. So we have to, how, how the government should plan the future for, for the nation, where should they provide the, the location of these new cities. So we can't just draw and say this is the future, we have to understand what's happening. So right now, one of the um, key understanding is like, this is all China, but then the floodplain is actually only consume about 6% of the overall land mass. So we are spending billions and billions and billions every single year to maintain only 6% of our land uh, every year. So is it a wise decision? Do we put new city like Shanghai, which is in the floodplain, Tianjin and Beijing is very close to it, so when it comes to flood, uh, the, the whole, whole, whole big city will, uh, or a region will get wiped out. So, uh, um, is it wise to do this? And then, of course, in the western type of uh, western uh, uh, China, which is more uh, like a desert kind of situation, like Xinjiang. So, how do we plan this uh, city, new cities, uh, in, in different types of regions? So, so we create these uh, called, uh, we call it the security pattern, ecological ecological security pattern. It's where basically identify where are the places that we have to safeguard in terms of biodiversity, in terms of cultural uh, heritage. So all these layer comes together. Uh, where are the places that needs to be preserved, uh, both in terms of heritage, uh, tangible heritage, and tangible heritage, and also the natural environment. So and then um, so that is like the general roadmap uh, for for the government to understand what is happening, what should be happening in the, in the, in the near future to provide a blueprint uh, for, for the decision maker. And then the second one is uh, 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 the master plan for uh, Beijing. Uh, it is also commun uh, commissioned by the Land Resource Bureau in, uh, by the municipal. Uh, basically also create the uh, ecological infrastructure uh, for, for the city. So we go through the same uh, analysis and process uh, uh, to understand what's happening. We know the northwest part of uh, Beijing is more green. Can we actually extend some of these uh, uh, natural environment within the city, which is uh, a, a heritage kind of uh, area? So uh, we don't provide a single solution, but we provide scenarios to the decision makers. Uh, we have this uh, uh, kind of, we call it the lower uh, minimal ecological infrastructure. Basically, all these green spaces are safeguarding uh, to, to maintain the efficiency uh, of our ecology, uh, the effectiveness of uh, how, how nature could, our uh, animals can, can go through, and with still enough uh, corridor for, for, for these uh, to create habitats. So, we are not rejecting urban development, but how do we have nature to coexist within the city uh, is an important question. So all the brown area, gray area, you are allowed to build, uh, and also the yellow area are allowed to build. Uh, this, this uh, right now, Beijing is about 25 million of population. This scenario could uh, uh, be about, uh, to serve about 40 million people uh, in this city. So in terms of medium uh, kind of uh, density, uh, this is maintaining the current kind of population and we reserve more space uh, for, for, for nature, for green space and open space and recreational space. And of course the ideal scenario is to move out some of the population from the main capital 
uh, to the how 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 uh, 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 of Beijing, which the government is actually doing already, that they are uh, moving some of the administration center uh, in the proximity uh, uh, city, cities to create a, a bigger region. So that's why all the high speed rail and, and all this stuff are happening. So people actually do travel from city to city, from Tianjin to, to Beijing, which only take them 45 minutes of high speed train. Every day they are commuting. So it's like when I have to go from my home to the office, which is maybe only five kilometers, but I could stuck in the traffic for an hour. So so that's it's the same thing in, in, in India as in, in Bangkok for sure. So so uh, we are just providing different scenarios uh, in, in here. So um, in terms of master planning, it is a medium kind of scale. It is a 500 hectare uh, a, a city. Uh, a region, a district that we have to plan. So instead of conventional, conventional kind of planning, we'll lay out all the road system and all this. We put nature first, we put the, the water as the main driving force uh, in terms of planning the city. And then things, because everyone wants to have a waterfront, right? It's good environment. And it, it's actually, we are not creating a only win situation, but a win-win-win situation is what we are looking for. We want the people, the citizen, to be happy. We want, as a designer, to be proud as well. We want the real estate to make money as well, and then government to create a nice environment for the citizen as well. So, so it's actually um, a mutual benefit kind of uh, condition. So, uh, uh, this project is actually under construction. It's almost completed. Uh, so, um, you can see all these. Uh, uh, water bodies, we basically minimally kind of connect them together. So we create this water uh, river and then canal. Uh, and then because of the water, you bring nature. Because you know, trees and, and habitats, uh, uh, animals actually come uh, close to this natural uh, environment. So a uh, very simple kind of way to, uh, to um, think about how we plan a city, actually just by putting nature as the highest priority. So now I'm going to flip through a few uh, key projects uh, uh, out of the uh, 600 different projects. Uh, eight different principles I want to emphasize in here. Maybe later on, if you guys have the workshop, maybe it will be useful as well uh, and in a smaller scale. So the first one would be make friends through flood, changing some, something like a gray info structure into a green info structure. So, um, very simple uh, idea. This is a, a project in Zhejiang province which flood every single year. Uh, we create inner river to create a natural buffer. So uh, uh, flood don't come to, to, to these uh, city uh, urbanized space uh, severely like the past. So we have these concrete ch channels uh, uh, back in the days. But you know, concrete and stone actually, yes, I know that. Uh, it's restraining the water. Uh, and um, you, when it overloads and then and then water will actually overflows back to the city so it creates all these flash flood, flood and, and conditions. So we knock down the entire embankment, knock down the concrete and make it into a natural embankment. Become a linear park where people can enjoy it uh, uh, as a recreational space. So instead of a boring kind of uh, edge, we turn it into <coughs> a, a floodable landscape where people can enjoy it. So of course we go through this uh, analysis and we, this is one of the hot spots of uh, flood uh, to occur uh, annually. So um, of course these are different spaces. Another project which we won the World Architecture Festival last year as the best landscape project is a project in uh, the founders, Dr. Tong Jeng Yu's hometown in Tienpa. You can see it's a flood kind of a peninsula like uh, and uh, this confluent pond. Uh, so you can see this, what happened before, and then in three, four years, we, we knock down this wall and become a natural uh, uh, embankment where people can stay and, and play. Uh, it's a 30 hectare site. Uh, the main idea for here is uh, to prevent flood, and also at the same time, uh, there's another mission that we have to complete is to connect the city, the northern city and the southern city together. So we built the skywalk, the bridge, and we carefully study. So that's why the scientific part has become so critical for us to, to understand the flood uh, as well. To place where these, uh, uh, how high we should place the, the, the bridge and connection point uh, uh, 
should be located. And fortunately, we have encountered a 50-year flood uh, uh, in our site before like uh, three months of our opening and this uh, flood situation. And then this is the non-flood situation, which is uh, a beautiful part. And then every single day, about 40,000 of 40,000 people are using the bridge crossing the city uh, uh, every single day. So we use the landscape, we use the embankment to clean the water so it's not a polluted water anymore. It's clean enough for people to touch, for kids to play. We see design that will deal with different seasons, dry season, uh, wet season, flood season, and some kind of climate. How do we deal with, deal with this kind of condition? Uh, how do we think about material that actual water can infiltrate into the ground as well and create different types of experience. The second principle would be go productive. How do we create something low cost and low maintenance? Uh, this is a canvas which is a 21 hectare site. Uh, the story behind uh, this is uh, the principal from the school uh, call Dr. Yu and say, Dr. Yu, we have a problem. I spent all my funding and money on building all the architecture, the building of the campus, and I have no more money left uh, to build the whole campus. So how do we create a landscape? How do we uh, make it look like a campus so it's not like a desert? Uh, so the, And of course, it's an architecture school, so uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's also something quite interesting. Uh, so what is cheap uh, in terms of landscape is farming. So you grow crops, you grow rice, in here, to, we just steal whatever is necessary to create interesting uh, experience and, and circulation. And of course, uh, different seasons will come in different color, and we create outdoor kind of classroom for people to to to, um, to to students to study. And we allow goats to kind of just walk around, sheep walk around uh, in within the campus. So they have food to eat at the same time. We leave room for rats to, to you know after the conference, we leave a small piece for for the rats. Uh, to, 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 to eat as well. So, and every single year, who is going to maintain the landscape? Who is going to maintain the campus? Would be the students and the professor who is actually going to to, to work on the, on the ground. So, actually, the school can actually cut the funding to hire staff to maintain the campus. <laughs> so, so, so I, I believe this is something that, um, and, and every single year, there will be maybe one or two harvest days. So, everyone will work on the you uh, exercise, I think it's a joke for, for the landscape architect play, play on the architects because we never exercise, right? <laughs> we drink beers. Uh, so, so, so kind of force us to work uh, on the ground to get our hands dirty, you know? And uh, so this is something go productive. Uh, so um, a recent project that was also built, uh, it was something like that. In, in two, three years, we changed it into a farm field with uh, sunflowers. So it rejuvenated the entire uh, uh, district along the river. So now it becomes a uh, different season, different crops could rotate, uh, different experience. We create this uh, uh, bridge that follows the topography. Uh, people come back and people will act like playing yoga, like exercising, coming to have the communal kind of uh, picnic. Uh, and all this thing is happening. Uh, so this happened to be the opening day. There's about 50,000 people are here coming to the park on that day. So, um, and we built structure as well. So uh, uh, there's the observation power to create this kind of scenic view around the entire kind of district. So um, also the, the co-productive, how can we take on a project that is 310 hectares in size, and we've been completed in uh, three years. So basically, really, farming, there was the rendering, we don't even have time to do nice rendering, but then we have, we have to spend, we have to go on site, we move our entire team to, to the site to work on the site with the contractor at the same time. So uh, to, to, to create a city park, which will probably happen in the near future, uh, and turn it into a nice uh, public space in the middle. So uh, how do we kind of uh, incorporate some of the uh, traditional uh, materials and village kind of experience as part of the new design as well, the new experience? Uh, how do we find out some of these essence? I mean, people will find their own ways to, to use the park. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, some, sometimes we'll keep some of these uh, old uh, uh, historical or valuable kind of elements. And we stop designing something that is overly intrusive. Uh, the third principle would be green sponge. How do we create a water resilient city? Uh, this is a, a, a very handsome site uh, in Carby, which is very cold in the winter. Um, this fumigation uh, that we have uh, is a dry out wetland that we have to recover. Uh, and then at the same time, we want to, the city wants to have a park. They want to grow from a point 30, uh, 300,000 population into a 2 million uh, uh, population city. So, uh, and of course, they have problem with the uh, 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 water. So it was a dry out wetland like this. And then in three, four years, we turn it into a nat natural lush kind of uh, uh, environment. So this is what happened in 2012, no building at all. But this natural wetland become a new uh, 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 central park for the district, where in two years, we can see all the skyscraper coming up. So, so what we are doing in here is just very minimal that we just develop the whole entire edge. Of the of the of the central wetland, we create these buffers to clean the surface runoff from the road. So we clean the water and use those clean water uh, through plants, clean the water, and then we use them to recharge the wetland uh, and recharge the aquifer. So so birds are coming back in here um, simultaneously, and then people are uh, enjoying this uh, kind of uh, experience. So, so we are really looking for this project. It's a minimal kind of design, but also benefit the, the developer and the uh, citizen at the same time. Also in Harbin, um, uh, we master plan the uh, whole uh, uh, cultural precinct. This is a new uh, opera house designed by another Chinese architect called MAD, uh, doing a nice kind of fluid design. Uh, so, we, how do you design something which is minimal and productive as well? Uh, the fourth principle is uh, how do we use landscape to create a living system. It's like a living machine. Uh, we clean the polluted water, which is shown in this project. We are part of the 2010 uh, uh, Shanghai World Expo. Uh, we were given a task that we have to uh, design something uh, uh, experimental and educational at the same time. So, uh, um, and Turency is the only landscape architect that was involved in, 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 in this uh, entire expo. And you can imagine all these uh, uh, nice pavilions uh, uh, happening all around here, the Spanish pavilion, the, the, the UK pavilion, Danish pavilion, all this stuff. And we are doing an, an experiment of cleaning the water from the Wangkujang, which is a spray pipe water, which is heavily polluted. Uh, it was a port in here. So, uh, how do we? Uh, clean the water through uh, different steps of terraces. Something very simple in here. You can we pump in the water. We use the gravity basically to to create these terraces. So it's like a farm back in the day. So you create terraces and let water to flow. And then in between the terraces, we, we we put in the plants. So when when we pump in the water, which is grade five, we stone now this to fence it off, so no one can actually touch it. When it goes all along becomes cleaner and cleaner. So this water, when it comes out, is grade two, grade three, which is good enough for uh, some people to touch. And then we actually, this water are uh, using uh, for irrigation for the entire exposed site. Uh, so so um, it's something which is also productive in some way that we can reduce the water. So we create this uh, care system. We uh, we put in the plants which are which can absorb the pollutants a lot. Uh, so uh, it's not necessarily a native plants, but we carefully have agorists and horticulturists to, to select uh, the plants. So uh, to create this uh, functional landscape and also at the same time which could be beautiful. Uh, three more principles to go and then uh, I'm done. Is the third one is, uh, the fifth one is to let nature do the work. We don't have to do everything. We don't have to design and over-design everything. Sometimes we just need to do enough and let nature and let the process to take over by itself. So there is a brownfield site, uh, 22 hectares in size. Uh, from a brownfield site, in three years, two simple cut and field. Uh, this project has two phases. It's more heavily polluted, so we excavate the soil and let the, the soil breathe again. Kind of, um, and then we create these different depths of uh, 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 
ponds and uh, containers or bubbles uh, uh, and uh, wetlands. So we, we bring back uh, uh, habitats. So deeper one, you can have fish. Some of the shallow one, you have these uh, different mosses and bacteria and, 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 and different habitats to grow. So in three, four years, we turn it into a lush um, uh, 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 green park. Uh, and in different seasons, it changes. Uh, so um, in different colors. So the sizes of the pond, of course, we also carefully try to study of what is the activity space for different types of animals uh, to be staying in, in this uh, kind of uh, ecosystem or atmosphere. Um, so um, and then so we are talking about diversity here, not just uh, nature diversity, uh, biodiversity, but actually on the on the second phase we have uh, program diversity. So we create different gardens. Uh, 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 next to it, so we connect them with an uh, uh, elevated uh, pathway. We could have uh, uh, different crops or different community gardens, different theme gardens to be taking place in these uh, 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 allocated kind of spaces, and then the rest is let nature to just keep on processing, keep on growing. Uh, and then this is a project which is a 13 kilometer long river. Uh, uh, it was a backyard kind of alley. Everyone just dumped their garbage in and rubbish in here. And then in uh, four years, we changed it into uh, ecological kind of uh, a green corridor uh, for the entire district, where it helps the uh, development happening around. So it was a natural river. People come and channelize it and, and they cover it. And then what we have done is basically reopen it. And, 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 and uh, excavate what is necessary to allow to create these different islands and habitats. So now people come back and fish. Uh, the water is clean enough um, and create these uh, recreational space. And then, of course, it has to be structural and, and fun for people to stay in here as well. So uh, we turn this into a more natural space, and, and it's also floodable at the same time. And then the, the use of material, we are very careful about uh, of how the durance and the durability as well. So um, it's also the same uh, same same place um, to basically simple consider this cut and fill process. Um, the sixth principle would be minimal intervention. Uh, this project, how do we create something minimal enough but we can have a maximized kind of return in here? So. Um, uh, with very simple strategy. This project is about 14 hectares in size. We have to complete everything from design to construction in nine months. Uh, so what we could do is basically a simple bench, a 500 meter long, 500 meter long bench that stretch all the way along the entire embankment. Uh, and we preserve what is good. Uh, uh, there's existing forests that are preserved. Uh, we determine the flood line. This uh, fiberglass uh, 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 red ribbon is also acting as a kind of a, a barrier for, for, for flood uh, protection at, at the same time. So, so this simple uh, strategy, uh, we integrate everything that we can consider uh, into this intervention. We incorporate lighting. We don't even need to have uh, a signage at all because the, the, the benches which stretch along the whole uh, our park will give you the direction of where you should go. And so, so how do we deal with these uh, uh, big sites and create community, uh, bring back some of the jobs and, and, and uh, to, to, the, to the community as well. So it's our project that we want to uh, uh, focus this on. Uh, and then uh, the seventh one will be value the ordinary. So how do we embrace the heritage and some of the uh, memories of the site? Uh, this is in uh, Guangzhou province, the southern part of China. Uh, in Guangdong, in Tongshan. Uh, it used to be a port. Uh, you can see it's a uh, ship uh, factory which went bankrupt uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in 1999. And then the government come in and take back the land and say, okay, we're going to design uh, a new central park for, for this site. So we are going to knock down all this uh, 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 factories and we tell them no. Don't, don't, we don't need to wipe out everything. So we, we kept whatever is possible. Uh, we kept the structure, 
uh, we kept the train track, which which is significant as a memory uh, uh, back in the days. Uh, if we just wipe it out, then all this memory and and all these uh, uh, which was significant to the to the uh, context, it will be gone. That won't be passed to the newer generation. And then after this uh, transformation. Uh, uh, Hotel like Sheraton actually come and built next to the, the park. So, so there's value that the that, that developer also see uh, uh, in having these uh, nice uh, parks. So it proves the win-win-win situation. Uh, the train track could be used for another purpose. Um, you know, and water tower could be a new observation tower. And then, uh, uh, and uh, these uh, structure become a place for wedding photo taking. So for some odd reason, when you visit Turin Skate Park, there's always a couple, tech, one or two couples taking wedding photos. So that also create a, a memories for, for the community around it as well. How do we repurpose some of the material? How do we reinterpret re some of these uh, old techniques and old materials? So um, some, sometimes it's like uh, the roof tile uh, can be used as a flooring tile as well. So this is something that we can uh, rethink in some of our projects. Uh, these dead fish on that actually become more productive that we could actually use them to filter water uh, through these different fish pond uh, to clean the water from the main canal. So it becomes like a living system in many different ways to rejuvenate the entire district to bring back uh, different communities. Uh, and uh, different types of activities could happen in, in different places. Even badminton court could, could, could be reinterpreted with a different new material uh, for recreational purpose. And then the last one that, that I want to mention and close it off would be an integrated kind of ecological solution. Uh, it's how do we um, think about all these different layers uh, at the same time. This project, which is a 90 hectare uh, site, uh, we were asked to design just the, the central precinct uh, uh, around the lake, but then, uh, which is somehow located at the downstream of the of the of the river, uh, which go across the entire city. And then, and, and the government said, "Can you do a nice cent cultural center?" I said, "Of course we can." Uh, but then we figure out the biggest problem is uh, is actually not the downstream; uh, it's the water, which is polluting the whole entire city. So even though if, if we do a nice park with dirty water, no one is going to come to the park. So we go backwards and tell the government, maybe you should really look into uh, how to redevelop the entire uh, uh, river uh, canal system uh, of the entire city. So the, the process of uh, slowing down, because Guizhou, this province, is very hilly. So, um, so uh, the water from the top of the mountain is actually very clean that you can actually drink. Uh, but then when it goes through the city, it becomes very dirty. And then when it comes to this uh, uh, canal, it, it, it just pollutes the, it becomes the, the dirty uh, backyard alley. So we create these uh, retention, accumulation ponds to slow down the water. So we maintain all the water from the top. The clean water will be somehow clean without uh, too many contamin contamination from the city uh, to slow down this process. So we transform something like this uh, into something more natural and accessible for people uh, in, in four years. So this 900 hectare site, uh, we create, so basically we create different um, um, ways uh, to slow down the water, to actually allow water to stay and be clean uh, before it goes to our site. Uh, so, and then we, it's seasonal as well, some of the pathway can be flooded, some of them could be maintained as a permanent kind of circulation, but all these water coming from the top of the mountain will be ensured will be somehow clean uh, in the central uh, lake area. So, uh, and this one shows that we don't have to do everything, uh, we don't have to cover everything, we just need to build enough uh, along the, the experience the circulation pathway as well to create something uh, uh, exciting um, and leave rooms for nature to grow uh, in time. So uh, that leaves with a question of uh, how, whether we should really 
uh, what's our future? How do we move on? Do we go with the big fee or do we go with the little fee? Uh, and I want to just close off uh, with uh, a book from uh, Lao Tzu, which is the Confucius uh, master. Is uh, nature does not hurry, yet everything accomplished. So we, in China, we design our ecology. It's not just for uh, aesthetic purpose. It's actually part of our survival. It's our art of survival. Actually, the topic that was given is planning with people. Actually, it's a very big topic, and it's actually too large for me to say. But nevertheless, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw in for my um, past examples that um, we use planning to work with people. And to be more specific, I like to um, frame my presentation in terms of tool and framework. And I think, um, hope that it will be useful for your um, Chunsang project. Um, when you talk about planning, you know, most of you may think of um, a very uh, state control mechanism, you know, land use planning, comprehensive plan that deprives people and, um, you know, society as a whole. Um, but actually, there's a very tiny bit in planning discipline. There's a whole school of thought, dedicated planning that work with people, but unfortunately, you know, Planning as a control mechanism play a very dominant role in our Asian cities. So I'm trying to speak from a different point of view from that planning discipline. And when we um, talk about people, um, because city is very complex, so I, um, sometimes I don't work directly with local residents. I work with um, you know government or state agency because sometimes they need to be empowered as well. So you know throughout my project, I'll show different um, them strategy that how I work with people at a larger society. Okay. Right. So this is a kind of framework that I put my head together and try to frame this presentation and hope it easier for you to follow. Um, the planning discipline that I use is very much about strategic planning. And this is a framework. We focus a lot on change. As um, I think this morning session, you also mentioned about change. How are we gonna, how are we gonna um, see the whole picture of change? How are we gonna work with it? The change that I work with are two main changes. The first one is about internal change, which is urban. In a very context specific, it can be like urban project, SkyTrain, BTS, Dyke, you know, any other project. And also about the social change as well. Uh, what will be the future of um, you know, um, urban society? Are we facing aging society? What about economic structure? So this is very important. And the other change that I work with is external change, which is you, know, you cannot stop it. You cannot um, uh, stop the sun to, you know, to heat up. Uh, it's climate change. And the implication is that it's flood and drought. And um, planning around me to work with this chain more holistically and inclusively. And the outcome to the people is, I hope that they have more adaptive capacity. And in this case, it's ability to adapt under these changes. Um, okay, cool. Cool. All right, so there are three examples that I would like to present today, which are these changes. The first one is non-learned or um, transit-oriented development. You probably heard of TOD, right? And I'll show you later. Now, Lil is an old community. And the second one is Black Power Canal Community Adaptive Strategies. And the last one is Urban Resonance Game. Okay, put Now, Lil in um, the strategic framework that I recently showed you. Um, to be more specific, the planning that I use is scenario planning and communicative planning that allow me to see change, which is in this case is the MRT or the underground project that are going to come to Nanlung um, area. And also about land tenure security. Um, the community doesn't have long-term tenure security. They are very likely to be forced evicted. And the result is that people more, have more adaptive capacity in terms of they have more adaptive strategies, you know, to um, for their um, future housing, and also they have more manual work in terms of planning knowledge. So what I did is, okay, this is Nang Leung. Nang Leung is um, one of the very old community in the inner city, and you know, very famous for food. So if you craving for food, please go there. And um, the 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 green line is an MRT that's gonna come. And um, you know there will be two main stations. 
Um, yeah. There will be two main stations at the um, both end of the community. What does this mean for planning law? The whole area. Okay, according to planning law, the whole area will be allowed to build up to like 10 story building within the 500 meter of the PPS or MRT law. This is by law. So without doing anything, right, the community will be forced to for sure. So that's how um, we bring in urban planning knowledge that actually there's a kind of knowledge which very much not working directly with local community, but again, you can be part of it. Um, it's just TOD, Transit Oriented Development. Some of you that really uh, mainstream urban design, you, you know it very really well. It's about how to design the neighborhood around the mass transit station to be more walkable, to be more mixed, to be more um, um, also to have like better density. So we show this. That's a possibility that for me can work with space. And um, to frame this change, okay, we do scenario planning um, as a tool. Um, to do this because we would like to provide different land and readjustment strategies to community. Okay? By using scenario, it doesn't mean that community have to choose one base single solution, but it's about providing different arrays of possibility of change that can occur to them. And within that process, you can create dialogue with community and telling them different knowledge about urban planning, which they never had chance to know before. And then they are more equipped okay, to adapt themselves. So to doing this, um, you know, you have to find two main driving force first that will change man learn. And in this case, of course, if the um, MRT construct without preparing anything to society, the area can be, you know, like, very extreme, developed to commercial way, right? You probably have a new biggest shopping mall <laughs> inside the inner city, okay? Maybe over 100 <laughs> um, shopping mall. And on another side, on the left side, is pure reserve. What does that mean to community? And the second driving force is um, where the community will be crossing or have to relocate or they can secure the tender. So these are two main driving force and within all these four metrics. You provide different um, development options or strategy in this case, and then you can create dialogue with them. For example, the first one, that the community um, can have secure tenor and um, very much the area be preserved, right? Um, I forgot to say that Nang Le have a very cultural, um, a very good cultural asset, okay? And, um, but what, what would be the implication? You can have like community-based tourism, but at the same time, the concern is there will be different um, land price and land value conflict, right? The price of the land will be increased when you have MRT enter the piece of land, but the land value um, um, concern with more cultural assets and community assets, you have to compete with the price and value. So that's a concern. And um, the option to you is if the community, if the area um, got developed um, mainly for commercial purpose, Obviously, um, if you want community to stay in the area, um, you have to think about new mix um, commercial area and also social housing. Some of them may have to be vertical. Okay, so what does that mean to them? Because if you have more commercial area, that means community have to live more vertically. Um, and the third option would be um, if you preserve the area, pre preserve the physical asset, for example, and. <coughs> you know, like move out local resident. So the implication would be a very unattractive destination in you know, tourism um, spot. And um, you probably have new mixed housing, you know, for like alien and uh, outsiders. Option for um, if the area develop, it could be very commercial and community relocate, obviously that area would be very new commercial area on the CBD for the city. So we need these development options, you know. We're not asking anyone to choose, but again, you know, it's for different changes and create a dialogue within each option so the community can ask and prepare themselves and have more knowledge to adapt. Right? All right. Um, and, um, well, I'm urban planner, so our master plan is not as nice as I can argue. Okay? And, uh, but all these options of master plan, again, it's not asking them to find which master plan they want. Okay, but we want, we use master plan to create dialogue. For example, for option one, you know, community-based tourism, most of the community um, can remain in the area, and this is the area where the PSA will happen. 
And again, you know, it's very important to mentally change. And um, the extreme scenario is like this, where I was the area but um, commercially developed. It. So it, everyone have to relocate and live in a high-rise building. So, you know, they see different possibilities. And um, the second phase of now learn that we work with the community, we use communicative planning tools. Um, I believe that one of the major problems of urban planning knowledge in Thailand is that uh, the knowledge about planning is only in the hand expertise and technocrat. And also my school is reproducing that, you know, unfortunately. Um, but in fact, if the community have more knowledge okay, about what planning is, about law and regulation, that is not only to um, um, have more inclusive planning, but they have more knowledge to negotiate further. No matter what the result will be in the future, because we cannot control everything, right? So in that process, I think we can create a room for men over for them to have some social change. And I believe that you know by deciding the right tool to communicate directly with, with um, local residents about planning knowledge that will allow them to think further and use knowledge further. Um, so this is a framework that, that um, we designed. So um, basically, um, there are um, four questions for, um, I think these are key um, planning knowledge that you know community need to be um, um, to learn and also to ask themselves, what actually is TOD? I mean, TOD seems to be a um, very flashy term, everyone uses it, but what actually it is? So we design a tool to tell them what exactly TOD is. The second one, what would be your future housing type? Is it low rise, high rise? What the implication of that to them? And the third one is we design a tool to be able to communicate about the future carrier that they can adapt themselves to cope with um, future change when the MRT um, will already, um, you know, like construct. And the last one is what would be the future community organization, you know, like to, <coughs> to survive. You cannot live um, individually like um, in, the, in the past. You have to have your organization so you can pay back the rent, you can be more organized as well. So all of this, um, actually after this project, the community felt very, um, I, I, I don't think I use empowered, but you know, they, they, they felt that they never have any chance to know this knowledge before. So it really mean a lot to them. And they feel that, you know, no matter what change will happen to them, they can cope with it. So that's a very important um, process. Okay, so the second project is the Lot Pal Canal Community Adaptive Strategies. I think this is one of the biggest um, Thailand project that many community architects in Thailand get involved. <laughs> um, many of you are in this room as well. Unfortunately, Thai government have a kind of policy for flood, flood, flood policy that building dike. Okay, they still use like great infrastructure, of course, because it's easy and it, you know, very popular. Um, so they came up with a one single best solution that okay, uh, we have to widen the canal. Right? I mean, Bangkok is um, uh, Venice of the East, whatever. And um, they, they said that, okay, if we can widen the canal by 38 meters, then Bangkok will not face flooding in the future. Can you imagine that? It's really against any science. <laughs> not speaking about how would that be realistic on ground. Because most of the building that actually um, you know, block the canal is not just only from people, but from the building. <laughs> so anyway, um, um, okay, so that was that's that, that piece of design, a pretty fine meter width and also value is about one point five meter, very simple, you know, very engineering solution. So um, we gather together and um, you know, um, I work in um, um, flooding um, for many years. So I, I knew that, you know, this is not gonna solve flooding. Um, problem in Bangkok, but how are we going to work with them? You cannot go up and tell state authority that your solution is very bad. It's not going to heal Bangkok. So they're going to shut the door and stop talking to you, right? I mean, that's very simple. So you have to work with their interest somehow, but still beneficial community. Okay? Um, so what, what did we do? Alright, so they strategy, the strategy to develop um, you know, can it canal areas, um, 
uh, um, development is not just about housing in this case, it's a very urban project because each canal has the length of about 24 kilometer, 30 kilometer, and stretching over like eight districts. Okay, so it's very big um, urban scale. So the criteria for zoning this canal, the 24 kilometer canal, um, in relation to urban content is the first one about water drainage strategy. We have to talk in that language, um, in government language, right? You can drain water. Make them believe <laughs> that they can do something to the city. Secondly, urban infrastructure. There are coming projects like BTS and MRT line. You know, that talk the yellow line, pink line, green line. It's not happening yet, but this is in the next five years, okay? All BTS will be um, constructed. And this is the tunnel, okay? So in order to develop the land, you have to think about future change about the new project as well. You cannot just think about how many will be there and then 10 years they want to have new challenge. They will. Okay, so we have to expand our vision to 30 years, for example. And um, what about the, the, the canal? On East Canal in Bangkok, um, um, not everyone knows where it is, right? <laughs> you know where uh, this canal? I mean, um, because it's very detached for, you know, like uh, um, Bangkok um, public people. Okay, so how can we provide a new public space for urban residents as well? Okay, it's more like a win-win. And very importantly, how can people still safe along the canal? Okay, so this is, these are very different layers of data. So the point that I want to speak specifically is what are kind of data that's going to challenge state decision making, right? As a planner, you cannot just um, tell them like direct solution, right? It's very political. Planning is very political. You have to provide some data that make them, them think that they are doing something and in your way that you're going to benefit community. So I'm going to talk about what are key data for decision making that's going to change state authorities. And also I work a lot with scenario planning, I'm going to show you that. And in this case, urban change is about the um, urban project BTS and DIKE and also whether or not community we have land tenure security and climate is very much about flooding and people we have more adaptive strategy. Uh, okay. All right, so these are three key um, data for decision making, which provide three key strategies for canal area development. The first thing is about flood adaptation. Government believe that building dike are gonna save Bangkok, but actually we're more concerned about drainage strategy for Bangkok is not, it's not about the speed, the speed of the, 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 the water drainage, which government believe. They think that by widening this canal, the speed can be increased by 40 millimeter per second. What does that mean? But actually we need more space for water. We need space for water to retain uh, during the um, flood season, right, the flood is space to overflow. It's not just about the speed that you have to drain water to the sea, because that also leads like other systems, okay, uh, pipes, river, and also sea rise. You cannot control that. You have to provide more room for river. So, you know, we kind of like introduce this area to them to, to be able to um, work with that interest that they want to save Bangkok from future flooding. And um, secondly, we work with um, landscape architect. Obviously, building concrete diet is very bad for maintenance. And also, Bangkok is uh, on the soft clay, meaning that we have very high level of land subsidence. You can see many diet collapse because land subsides, all right? So we say that in that interest, that's gonna cost you more for maintenance. I'm not gonna say that, that your solution is bad, but indirectly it's really bad. Okay, <laughs> Second, <laughs> secondly, um, community got condemned, right? Very directly, that they block water, they pollute water, but you know, I show you that picture, okay? And also, water polluted, not because from, from community. Our housing estate drain water directly to the canal. We treat canal as a drainage system, not a canal per se. Okay, so we have to say that actually um, based on our past research, okay, we had about 1,000 households survey about socioeconomic loss of the household, especially low-income household, how much they would loss if they have to relocate because of flooding, 
Okay, so that is a very minimal figure. It's about 200,000 baht per household. And to calculate that with 9,000 households, government will need to use about 1,500 million baht to recover community, to help them to relocate. So that's speak that language. They don't want, they don't have that enough money, that much money, right? That's even more than the construction of the dike itself in terms of budget. So this kind of data, you know, um, help, help us to work with them, help us to open channel, to uh, allow community to have space to negotiate with state authority, okay? The last thing is, um, we visualize this kind of canal settlement, not just because you want to help low income community, but you can have a nice urban project like your company was doing. Um, you know, you can have a new park, you can have a new transit node where you connect river, BTS, MRT, and you open canal to the public more. So a canal is not just drainage system, it's become um, water for, you know, wider public. So all these, okay, are data that we as a planner team provide community clients that can work further. Okay, and uh, what are um, driver for changes? Um, we use scenario planning as well. Again, um, it's about the dike design. Is it going to be a concrete dike or is it going to be about land use design? It's about retention point using non-structure. We help with flood drainage system. And, um, you know, the... Um, uh, another different um, driving force about whether community will be relocated or they can secure tenure. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm gonna... okay. All right, so these are the um, example design done by a professor um, in faculty architecture in Kaseksa University. And um, we provide this strategic master plan to communicate with state authority. Uh, and also we communicate this with the head of local community as well. But these kind of master plans strategically tell them that if there's enough space <laughs> by law, okay, by planning law and everything, okay, that technical thing, for you to widen a canal at uh, not, not 38 meters for sure, okay, maybe 20. And the community still can um, settle along the canal and you can improve landscape, okay. And some area, um, housing have to be vertical because you have less space and you have to provide that area for public use. For example, um, BTS connection. Okay. Right. okay, so let's move to my very last um, project. I think I can finish in five minutes. And um, about urban resident game. Um, uh, I've been working in urban residents um, from the past like seven years. Um, about how to save Bangkok from future flooding. Bangkok is one of the top 10 cities that will be underwater by the next 30 years. And government still doesn't have any plan to do it. And, you know, doing this all like dike construction and remove people from the canal. Going in a very long direction. So um, we use planning. Again, I use trade-off analysis within the um, scenario-based risk assessment. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that. Okay. So urban resident um, is a Jargon is um, academic jargon, but what does it mean? It doesn't mean that you have to um, prevent city um, from flooding, but actually you still have impact from flooding, but you have ability to recover as quick as possible. So that's why society is the key. Okay, so it's not just about engineer building dike. It's not just about how to build a wall to protect the whole Bangkok. Okay. It's about how you prepare society to cope with future change and in this time of flooding. Okay? So social reason is the key to urban resonance. We have to provide society we have capability change. Okay? The first thing, that how are they going to understand this change that is real? Flooding can happen in the future. And also change in the city as well. The new BTS, the new construction, the new commercial zone, the diet as a project how they can uh, um, um, have a holistic picture of this change. And the second thing is, how they're gonna forecast rates. I believe this because I don't think um, um, making Bangkok as a safe city um, from flooding is just only about state authority. I think that you know, in any developed context, all right, at least 30%, community have to adapt. State maybe can help you 70%, that in a very working state system. Okay. 
But for us, you know, there's a lot of self organization, there's a lot of self adaptation on the ground. How are we going to strengthen them? How are we going to make them to forecast and be able to access future rates that may occur to them? That's very important. The third thing is, RIC is very dynamic. RICs to me may be not the same as not, right? <laughs> not maybe concerned about what? <laughs> Vegetation. Maybe I'm concerned about shopping mall. I don't know. So what, what RICs to you is very dynamic, okay? You have to tailor the tool that can work with them, okay? The last thing is, assets rigs by different scenarios with holistic view and because rigs is dynamic as well. So we provide, um, how are we going to provide um, this kind of um, data in planning that can relate to everyday life decision making? For example, if you are going to buy a new house, do you have enough knowledge that that area was flooded before or it will be flooded in the future? We have all this knowledge. I mean, we as a government as well, but you know, they kept it. Okay, <laughs> this knowledge is everywhere, but local resident topic doesn't have it. So wrong. Okay, so wrong. Okay, all right. So we have to see CD as a complex system. Um, right. Um, in 2011 flooding, people evacuate not because they have um, flooding directly to their home. They relocate because of waste, they relocate because of disease, right, that come with water. So in this case, to see this complex system, you have to understand the cascading impact of flood that will happen to society. And um, I believe that by increasing social capability, for example, they have more tenure security, they have better healthcare system, um, and also infrastructure that can help absorb rates very um, um, importantly, okay? It's not just about building dike that reducing exposure of the city to flooding. Anyway, so this kind of concept, you know, um, got translated to computer-based model. And of course, this kind of diagram cannot communicate with anyone, right? But planner need this to work with government and show them some data, but it's not communicatable at all. Okay, so that's why we have to design a game, right? Okay. okay. So we design a game to help them to have outdoors experience them as um, you know, wider public, to be able to assess future risk, to be able to forecast future risk, to be able to prepare themselves. Okay? So here are two key driving force. The society can be very complex, like very mixed neighborhood, cosmopolitan, or the society can be rather slow, like you know, going to a society. And um, on another diving force is whether we have flooding or not, okay? So in each box are uh, um, development options. For complex society, you probably face like a very fast-growing city and a lot of investment if there are no case of flooding, right? Uh, but in case of flooding, you know, um, you're going to have to find a very complex solution to suit every group of society. And under flooding, and if the society, um, you know, like have more aging population, that means you're gonna have increased vulnerable population. You know, how are we gonna take care of them? And um, on a different box, um, if there's no flood, but the society is go very like, um, you know, slow, there will be slow investment, and city can be trained. So all this, you know, can generate dialogue directly with um, society, and we framed it and used this to design our game. Oh, okay, before the game, you know, like, it's also about encouraging um, the city, um, city to um, um, challenge them whether they have to do anything or not doing anything, okay? Many of flooding this cause is about, oh, now again, you're talking about disaster, you're talking about flooding, you're talking about disaster, you're talking about earthquake, this Q investment. Right? Governor, state authority doesn't like this because it's a cute investment. For example, land price, right? So that's the end of the story. So when we work with them, we have to show them that within these rates, you have opportunity to improve the life of local residents. So whether or not flooding will happen, you're still likely to have opportunity for doing something to society. Okay? All right. All right, so here's the game, right? So we design a game, okay? We're working with open space to design a game that will allow wider public to have all these experience, accessing future rates, 
that we're going to occur to them because of flooding. And also future change to society, to urban as well. Okay? We have all those computer-based model experience in a very fun way. Okay? So everyone is a city mayor, city leader, number one. Okay? You have your own future of city. We provide them with different cars and all different drivers of city change. Okay? Maybe you are facing aging city. And obviously, when you manage city, you have to have money. <laughs> Everyone will have like 20,000 million baht to manage your city. And um, this is a bot break bot game that um, you know you use dike as uncertainty that whether or not you will face flooding. Okay, you have six numbers, so that blah, 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 how many percent uncertainty you can calculate. And also, um, um, see it based on our future flood maps. But we simply find it to be more graphic, look less scary. <laughs> for the future, um, that back home can face this rainfall flooding or so forth of flooding. And to win, right? It's a game. You can win and you can cheat. <laughs> like reality. Um, um, you, you have opportunity to assess risks by solution. And within the risk assessment, how can you find opportunity? That's very challenging. And you can invest and then you have to spend money. And at the end, we calculate who have like a highest um, um, score win, okay? Okay, so at least they have experience to assess risks, and also within that process, the solution that they provided us, we are gonna use that information to synthesize and provide a recommendation to city um, government. Okay, so that's the picture. We, we tested out already with state and non-state authority, and it went really well. Uh, the uh, people had a kind of dialogue they never had before. You know, like sometimes when you're in a meeting room, you cannot say direct thing with the city um, government. I mean, you have to this and that. And, um, but within this game, you know, you are all like city mayor, you have a choice to say. So the dialogue within the conversation was very interesting. Okay, I'm going to conclude my um, presentation. The first thing is planning is not only about state control, okay, but unfortunately that play dominant role in our Asian city. Planning is an enabling mechanism to self adaptation, at least what I use, okay. And scenarios allow holistic and inclu inclusive planning. Scenario planning is not about finding one single best solution, but provides a wide range of future possibility and generate dialogues that you never had chance to do. And um, the more scenario you think, the more you plan for adaptation. The more you have knowledge, you adapt um, yourself in the future. And the last thing is very important is collaboration. Um, all this work wouldn't be possible. As a planner, I don't have a skill like you have as a community architect. I work closely with community architect and in this case open space client and her team that allow me to have trust with community to um, you have the kind of skill that I don't have okay you have like trust building skill you have um, time to spend with community where I have to do my paperwork at university really you know stupid thing and um, you have you have skill that I don't have so collaboration is the key. And I have to give the kind of like law and regulation that sometimes, you know, it's very technical. So the collaboration is key and all this. Um, I think, you know, community architect and planner have to work closer together somehow. <laughs> okay, thank you.